Welcome back to the Safari, friends. In this series, we'll be going over some interesting spots all around Kalimdor and discover the hidden history of places you've been dozens and dozens of times. Trust me, by the end of this video, you'll be like, What the f? Why would they this do that? Reason, but what? In the war, they what? Removed really? Wait, what? What the, what the f? Wait, what? What the f? I had no idea about this. What the f? What? So let's just jump right back into it. Last episode, we touched briefly on the Third War, which culminated in Hyjal being damaged. After the war, it was a significant evolution for the Alliance and Horde, and they turned into the factions we are much more familiar with today. Peace was established between the two, for the most part, but more on that later. The point is, the Horde established a foothold in the deserts of Kalimdor and named it Durotar, after Thrall's father, Durotan. It was here where Orgrimmar was established, and young orcs could use Durotar as a proving ground to shape them into respectable members of the Horde. Which includes beating the crap out of peons that are just trying to get a break. During their travels, they also adopted the trolls into the Horde, as well as the Tarin, but these races had their own baggage. The Tarin needed help with the invading centaur, and the trolls had to deal with... betrayers in their ranks. <laughs> You see, at this point in time, Vol'jin was the leader of the Darkspear, and he had a childhood friend named Zalazane. Zalazane was always viewed as the companion of Vol'jin, probably because Vol'jin was always touted as a hero, because he was the son of the former leader, Senjin. This caused Spite to dwell within Zalazane, and he ultimately betrayed his people for revenge. With the use of voodoo magic, he mind-controlled a good majority of the Darkspear trolls on the Echo Isles and commanded them to do whatever he pleased. Vol'jin ordered the trolls to flee the Isles so more of his people would not fall under Zalazane's magic, and they established Senjin Village on Durotar's shores. Work, work. Players are sent to kill Zalazane and bring back his head as proof, but each time Zalazane was killed, the voodoo magic of his quote-unquote head would wear off and it would be nothing more than painted rocks, or a bunch of coconuts. It wasn't until the Cataclysm pre-patch where Zalazane would truly die. The might of the Horde rallied at the Isles to deliver the final blow to Zalazane, but the Witch Doctor summoned an impenetrable shield around himself. I can't be touched! No living thing can make its way through this barrier! The Echo Isles be Zalazane's to rule, Shadow Hunter! Now and forever! That was until... Bomb Swamdi, the troll god of death, dragged him into the underworld. Oh my, my, my. Who? Who that be? Well, don't you know yet, man? There be no hiding from Bwan Swamdi. <laughs> no, no, no! In BFA, we can find the tortured spirit of Zalazane in Bomb Swamdi's temple called the Necropolis. But oh my goodness, in BFA, he also breaks away from Bomb Swamdi's control and goes back to the Echo Isles and is immediately defeated once again. <sighs> you died as you lived. Forgettable. Another zone off the coast of Kalimdor is one you would never want to find yourself in. The Dustwillow Marsh is a humid hellhole filled with crocs, spiders, and even dragonkin. The Horde have established a base here created by the Stonewall Ogres, who were once led by Rexar, but have continued the cycle through leaders. What makes Dustwillow Marsh so interesting is the Alliance's participation in the zone. All over the human marshes, there are Theramore deserters who seek Horde blood despite the peace treaty established between the factions. This bitter hatred between the Theramore deserters is related to a critical part of Kalimdor lore. During the Third War, the Horde stole ships in South Shore and sailed across the Great Sea, but Dalen Proudmoor, Lord and Grand Admiral of not only Cold Tourists, but all of the Alliance, tracked them down through the sea. Both crash-landed on the Darkspear Isles, but that is a whole story for another time that doesn't really relate to the story I'm trying to tell now. The point is, Dalen eventually sailed back to Kul Tiris, got as many soldiers as he could, and he made his way to Kalimdor with a mission to squash the Horde right then and there, and not allow them to gain a foothold on this new continent. He attacked places like Duratar and the Barrens, but when the Horde eventually started to fight back, he retreated to the Alliance stronghold of Theramore. 
Little did Daylin know that he'd bump into his daughter, Jaina Proudmore, who was not prepared for his arrival. Oh, Jaina, how is my little pumpkin doing? D Dad, it's, it's not what it looks like! You see, Jaina had a very different opinion on the Horde than her father. She was good friends with Thrall and thought the best way to stop the conflict between the two factions was to establish peace rather than never-ending war. This meddling with the Horde was something Dalen would not respect, so Jaina stayed in the marshes while her father usurped control over Theramore. Shortly after, Alliance forces would attempt to push out to take over the marshes but would quickly be overwhelmed by the Horde forces, so much like the Alliance in an Alterac Valley battleground, they decided to turtle up in Theramore and established a naval blockade in the bay. And much like the Alliance in any Alterac Valley battleground, it ended horribly. Jaina knew her father. She knew that he would never stop in his conquest to annihilate the Horde. Countless amount of lives would be lost on both factions, so something needed to be done. In an effort for the greater good, Jaina assisted Rexar in destroying the naval fleet outside of Theramore, and the Horde laid siege on the stronghold. Now despite the violent offensive attack by the Horde, Thrall tried to reason with Daelin, explaining that the Horde was no longer the savages that he fought against in the Three Wars, but Daelin was having none of it, and fought to the bitter end, and participated in mortal combat with Rexar. <laughs> Fatality. <laughs> Do not mourn, Jaina. Your father was a proud warrior, but I just beat the fuck out of him. High five, Thrall! Even though Jaina chose to play a critical role in her father being murdered, she was still pretty upset by it, and when the news reached the people of Kul Tiras, they were even more upset. They cried out for the horror to be wiped off the face of Kalimdor, and pleaded to the rest of the Alliance for aid. But the Alliance, um... To be honest, they didn't really care. There were much bigger problems with, oh, I don't know, the, the biggest human kingdom being overrun by undead, so they ignored the Kul Tiran's pleads for aid. The kingdom of Kul Tiras would take great offense to this, and isolated themselves from the Alliance, living in relative solitude and bitter frustration until the events of Battle for Azeroth. The deserters around Theramore are the remnants of soldiers who have the same hatred as Dalen, and would stop at nothing to annihilate the Horde. Now, why do the deserters think it's a good idea to wander into a very dangerous swamp instead of just, like, taking a boat and going home? It's a good question. Why are there still guards in Theramore after their leader blatantly betrayed them by just inviting the enemy into their home and probably killing a lot of their friends in the process? That's, that's another good question, so... Let's just move on. On the southern side of the continent, we can find the arid desert of Daenerys. While these rolling dunes seem plain, there are still places that creatures call home. The Caverns of Time is the home of the Bronze Dragonflight, a group of dragons tasked with protecting the true timeline. They are in constant conflict with the Infinite Dragonflight, who are the exact same thing as the Bronze Dragonflight, but they want to alter the timeline. Look, I I'll be honest, this place is just an excuse so players can experience the events of Warcraft history firsthand. Stuff like the opening of the Dark Portal, the culling of Stratholme, stuff like that. This whole section of lore really isn't meant to be taken seriously, I think. It's just here because, um, it's cool. Like, during the 15th anniversary of WoW, there was a disco room here, there's a volleyball net, ETC was here, Algalon was there, and Leroy Jenkins had a chicken stand. You can't get more silly than that. Another hub in Tenaris is Gadgetzan. It's run by the Steamweedle Cartel, a neutral goblin organization, and at first glance, this place seems pretty underwhelming. But there is a Hearthstone expansion about this place, and it was totally revamped to be like this gigantic, bustling city. Now, almost everything in Hearthstone is not canon. But in the book Traveler, a book for kids that takes place in the World of Warcraft universe, it also describes the city as a labyrinth of streets full of almost every known race. Now, this isn't what it looks like in the modern game, like at all. Probably because making a giant city takes a lot of time, and I highly doubt that the main story will ever take us back to Gadgetsan. So there's no real reason to update the city into the concrete jungle it actually is. So, let's talk about a real jungle. 
Welcome to the Ungoro Crater, aka Reference Crater. Basically everything you see here is one big reference. The name Ungoro Crater is inspired from the real-life place called the Ngorogoro Crater in Africa. Marshall's Refuge is a reference to the 1970s show Land of the Lost, Marshall being the last name of the characters. Holini and Willenden Marshall are reference to Will and Holly Marshall from the show. Mario and Luigi are here, Spaghetti. Link is here, and Ringo Starr is in a volcano. Ungoro was shaped by the Titan Watcher Freya. She created Ungoro, Sholazar Basin, and the Veil of Eternal Blossoms as places where the Titans could experiment with designs in these flourishing craters filled with life. The Wild Gods were birthed from these basins. The Wild Gods are like these manifestations of life and nature that multiple cultures around Azeroth worship. The Night Elves call them the Ancient Guardians, the Pandas call them the August Celestials, and the Trolls call them the Loa. But lastly, this place is filled with dinosaurs. Not, not, not sure what to say here. Um, there are dinosaurs are here, and and they are cool. But oh my God! Run, run, everyone, get away! Oh, oh, there's a big T-Rex! Oh, uh, run, everybody, run! Why are there so many people on the crater? Run! Oh my! Oh, uh, 